Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome, uh, add my welcome to Karen's this morning. Let um, let me pray as we begin. Gracious Father, thank you for the uh, tremendous privilege of uh, being able to learn together uh, from your word. And we pray, Heavenly Father, as we come to uh, this particular portion of it, perhaps more puzzling uh, than, uh, than most, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, give us uh, understanding, that we might uh, know you and your purposes better, uh, and that this understanding, this knowledge, might issue in greater obedience. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, I'd like to start, if I may, this morning by uh, reading something to you. It may uh, be familiar uh, to some of us. My mind, paralysed by the dreadful shape which had sprung out, out upon us from the shadows of the fog. A hound it was, an enormous, coal black hound, but not such a hound as mortal eyes had ever seen. Fire burst from its open mouth, its eyes glowed with a smouldering glaze, its muzzle and hackles and dewlap were outlined in flickering flame. Never, in the delirious dream of a disordered brain, could anything more savage, more appalling, more hellish be conceived than that dark form and savage face which broke upon us out of the wall of fog. Well, not a description there of one of the beasts of Daniel's dream, but as some of you may have recognised, uh, a description by Arthur Conan Doyle of the Hound of the Baskervilles. Inconceivably savage, appalling, hellish, so terrifying that even the great Sherlock Holmes was paralysed. Sherlock and the terror facing him was, of course, uh, a fictional. That's something that cannot be said, of course, uh, cannot be said uh, about a young man called Rada, who uh, grew up in Cambodia in the 1970s uh, under the Khmer Rouge. If you don't know much about that time of history, uh, I can commend this book to you, uh, Killing Fields, uh, Living Fields. Uh, not, though, if you're looking for a, a few hours of idle distraction. Uh, it gives an account of the uh, life under that uh, terrifying regime. More than two million people died, were murdered or from salvation, and 90% of the church uh, were killed. Rada was a, a young Christian man at the time, he'd been converted about two years previously, who like many uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, uh, uh, were, was, uh, was conscripted into uh, the workforce of the Khmer Rouge. Uh, one day whilst he was working in the forest, news reached him of the death of his father. Uh, he asked if he could go home to bury him and received the standard reply at the time, why go, you cannot make him alive again. Well eventually, a few days later, he was allowed home and uh, walking into the village his home village, this is the account. The first thing he noticed was the awesome silence and listlessness that pervaded the entire village. An air of death lingered everywhere. Reaching a little hut that belonged to his family, he turned away for he did not recognise the emaciated little girl squatting outside. It was his sister. Then he saw his mother. She was positioned in the doorway, bent forward, holding on to a broken off tree limb which served as a crutch. In her other hand, Rada noticed a few leafy twigs she'd found and was about to boil for food. Your father is dead, she said. At this, Rada leapt forward to hold her as she swayed faintly and fresh tears began moistening the holly bloodshot eyes. He felt her body so light and frail against him, heaving with great sobs. Her precious baby, it too had died, slowly starved, yet so patient, the way little ones are in death. 
it was beyond endurance. Choking and screaming with rage, Rada threw back his head and cried, Why have you done this to us, Lord? This is too much. Why have you done this to us? Lord, this is too much. A few of us, uh, none of us, I suspect, have suffered as much as Rada did, and I hope we never do, uh, face such suffering. But all, all of us will, at some time or another, face suffering of one kind or another. Be it bereavement, be it the frustrations of pain, of ill health, be it betrayal in relationships, fractured relationships, being, be it being sinned against, or the suffering of fighting sin ourselves. If you've never faced such suffering, well, can I say it's only because you're too young? It's only because you haven't lived enough yet. It's only a question of time. For all of us will face, at some time, suffering. And if you have faced that suffering, or when you do, you may well find yourself echoing Rada's plea. Why have you done this to us, Lord? It is too much. Well, if that cry finds any resonance with you, I'm uh, sure that uh, Daniel 7 will help us come to terms with things. If you've got a copy of the Bible uh, in front of you, do open it up at chapter Daniel 7. Uh, we've reached that in our journey through the book. And uh, if you've been with us so far, or if you've ever read the book, you'll know that it's at this point in the book you get a bit of a change. Um, and it's not just the beast more frightening than Sherlock's Baskerville hound that confronted it that makes it strange. Uh, we, uh, it's different. Um, we see, as the chapter opens, that there's a different king on the throne. Actually, it's King Belshazzar. Uh, we've gone back in time to... Uh, uh, he was on the throne in chapter 4. Uh, and so the Babylonians are still in control. We also see that this time, it's not the king who has dreams and visions that disturb him, that he needs Daniel to interpret, to understand. This time, it's Daniel who has the dreams and is disturbed by them, and needs help to understand them. In his dream, we see uh, verse uh, 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 1, verse 2 indeed, he's on the beach, by the sea, uh, in the middle of a great storm. The four winds of heaven are clashing, crashing into each other, the sea is being churned up in a mighty swell, and out of the murky depths arise four beastly creatures, increasingly sinister, the stuff of nightmares. And previously it was the kings who were disturbed by the dreams, this time it's Daniel. Do you see verse 15? I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. As well they might. So verse 16, he approaches one of those standing there and asks them the meaning of this. He seems particularly disturbed, doesn't he, by the last creature. So verse, in verse 19 and following. He's confused and he's frightened and disturbed and we might empathise with him had we been there. What on earth is going on? It's all very puzzling. Well, several things to note, I think, just as we look at this chapter together. The first thing uh, I think it helps us to understand, to Daniel to understand, to Rada to have understood in his cry for relief, that if you live with God as king, you will suffer from beastly kings. Beastly kings, that's who we meet in verses 1 to 8 in these dreams and visions. I mean, it's impossible to get a, a, a full picture of them, isn't it? it the, the, the description is... It's impossible to draw, but we get the drift, don't we? We can feel for the moment what it would be like to be faced by such beasts on a dark night. The first, like a lion, verse 4. The second, like a bear. The third, like a leopard. And the fourth, well, 
like nothing really at all. It's complete. It's without parallel. What on earth does all this mean? Well, it's anyone's guess, except it's not, is it? Because we're told, verse 17, the four beasts, the four great beasts, are four kings that will rise from the earth. Four kings ruling four kingdoms. It goes perhaps here of chapter 2. Kings who stand against and persecute God's people. Are there any particular kings in mind? Um, well, as you might expect, much ink has been spilt over such a question. Uh, and some see in the first one hints of Nebuchadnezzar in the first vision. Raised to his feet like a human, given a human mind, elevated from his position of an animal as we saw in his story earlier on in chapter 4. And certainly later on in the book, as Daniel has more dreams and visions, specific regimes are in view and indeed mentioned. But here I suspect it's not so much the specific regimes as the overarching thrust bit that is important for us to get a handle on. And that is the opposition of all these rulers, their hatred of God's people. As you say, Daniel is more exercised by the fourth one uh, and most keen to understand it. Verse 19, I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. Most terrifying, with its iron teeth and bronze claws that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. A beast with ten horns that give away to another horn with eyes. Well, Daniel wants to know, verse 20, about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others and had eyes and a mouth than spoke boastfully. A horn, verse 21, that wages war against God's people and destroys them. All very strange. What's it all about? Well, he's told, verse 23, the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the early ones. He will subdue the three kings. The three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for time, times and a half time. Daniel, understand this, know this for certain. In the future, kings will rise, regimes will come that will oppress, trample and devour God's people. This will be the experience of God's people. It will be terrifying. And it will look and feel as though everything is out of control, that all is lost. But, and this is the second lesson from this chapter, God's destruction of the, earthly be of the beastly kings is certain. Because do you notice, as all eyes are on the beasts at the front of the stage, behind them, almost unnoticed, beyond the floodlights, at the back of the stage, beyond the backdrop, the stagehands are at work, moving things around, shifting furniture, drawing up chairs. Thrones are being set in place, verse 9. Chairs are being arranged and people are taking their seat. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. It's a big stage. And books are being brought in, verse 10, and opened. Uh, the beasts beast don't see this. They, they're not aware it's going on. They're too busy persecuting God's people. They remain completely unaware of what's going on behind them, of the court gathering, and of a judge taking his place. Who's the judge? Well, none other than the ancient 
of days. God himself, he's the judge of this court. The judge before whom everyone, including these beasts, will one day come. Know for certain, you kings, you rulers, of peoples, of nations, of families, of colleges, of schools, of workplaces, the places where your word is law, where you hold sway, where you rule, those places where you abuse your power and authority and persecute God's people, know this. Know that God's judgment is coming. It may look as though he's absent, it may look as though he's left the building, he's, that he's uninvolved and uninterested in the goings-on with his people, but that's not so. If you just look behind the scenes, just glance behind the curtain, and you'll see that appearances can be deceptive. Don't judge by appearances. Don't think that all that can be seen is all that there is, or all that there will one day be seen. There is a world on view here, in Daniel 7, at the front of the stage. It's visible to all. It's the world where the beastly king holds sway. And it looks, to the audience, as though the performance is going to go on forever. But that's not so. That's not the case. Because there is another world, another reality, hidden at the moment, out of the limelight, at the back of the stage, and those who know of that reality or can see what's going on there just beyond the lights, well, they know that the visible world is not all there is and it will not last forever. God has not been sidelined, He has not been overcome, He has not been outdone, and you know what? He won't allow the current performance to go on forever. Daniel, understand this. People of the Holy God suffering, know this. Those who oppose you will not prevail. Neither in history, they will not last, kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. We were reminded last week, weren't we, of recent changes in Sudan, much to be thankful for. And of course the Khmer Rouge is no more. But not only will they not last in history, they will not stand in eternity. Because we see in Daniel 7 that at the end of history, when the show ends and the house lights go up, when all will be revealed, there is a court sitting, verse 26. And then everyone will see it, and be brought to it, and face judgment. And verse 26, the wicked beasts will be taken away, God's people will rule, the beasts will be destroyed. You see, once they seem to have the upper hand, but not anymore, no longer. God and his people will be vindicated, nothing is more certain. The third lesson we learn from this chapter is, I think, that the establishment of God's righteous king is equally certain. Verses 9 to 14, we've alluded to it already, this is the central bit of the, this chapter, that it's the pivotal bit really, where we have another vision entirely different from the beasts. Verse 13, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. One like a human being, that's what the word means. In contrast here, I think, uh, not least to the beasts. There before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. So here in the vision we have a human being, a man who receives from the throne of God authority, glory, power. But not only that, you see, quite extraordinarily, all nations and peoples of every language worship him. 
And he is not like the previous here today, gone tomorrow kings with their here today, gone tomorrow kingdoms. No, verse 14, his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Hang on a sec, you say for a moment. Um, we've heard this somewhere before, haven't we? And we have, if you've been with us in Daniel. Just glance back to the end of chapter 6, verse 6, verse 26, uh, where we, we read, People must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will will never end. I'll turn back a couple of pages to Nebuchadnezzar's words at the end of his letter in chapter 4, verse 34, where he writes, Then I praised the Most High, I honoured and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures. This is something that has been said throughout Daniel so far about God himself, his dominion, his kingdom, his rule, and now we see this human figure, one like the Son of Man. He is the one who rules an eternal kingdom, is worshipped by all peoples and nations forever. A human figure and a heavenly figure too. What we have in these verses is a picture of a royal ceremony, a a coronation, if you like. I mean, the, the crown's on telly at the moment, isn't it? Um, season four or whatever it is. Not as uh, good, perhaps, as the earlier seasons, uh, in some people's opinion. Uh, but if you remember back to season one, uh, when Queen Elizabeth was crowned, it was a, her, uh, uh, an amazing ceremony, wasn't it? An amazing depiction of it. Well, that is as nothing to what's going on here. One comes like the Son of Man. He comes into God's presence and God gives him authority and power and everyone worships him. And with his arrival, do you see two things happen? Did you notice two things happen? There's judgment on the beasts. God's enemies are destroyed. The persecutors of his people are destroyed. And there's an establishment of his rule. The rule of this God-man forever. Now if you're familiar with the New Testament, the Gospels in particular, you'll know that the Son of Man is one of Jesus' uh, favourite descriptions for himself. Sometimes it just means man, human being. But on other occasions, at key moments in the narrative, there is a clear self-conscious allusion to these verses in Daniel 7. So for example at his trial when he's asked straight out are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? Are you God's King? He says I am and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God uh, of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. The God Man, God -man come with God's authority to destroy God's enemies and establish his kingdom. The one through whom God will rule. And God has given Jesus this authority at his resurrection and ascension. He has given him the name that is above every name, that at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. We're... Um, we're coming up to Christmas at the moment, uh, the season of Advent, uh, Jesus, the baby, and the nativity. So we celebrate his coming. Is this how you think of him? This is not the baby of the nativity, is it, here in Daniel 7? Except that it is one of the same. Uh, the baby who grew up and went to the cross, the Son of Man who came not so much to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. What did all this mean for Daniel in Babylon? What did it mean for Rada in Cambodia 
in uh, under the Khmer Rouge. What does it mean for those who suffered under Daesh? What does it mean for the people of North Korea today, who suffer at the hands of those in power for their allegiance to Christ as Lord? It means that justice will come, that justice will be done, and that they and God will be vindicated. It may not look like that now, it doesn't, but that doesn't mean it's not true and that judgment won't come, it will, because Jesus rules and his kingdom will last. He has established it and it will last forever. But what about us uh, here in Lancaster who don't live, uh, who live, uh, who don't live in such circumstances and in many ways live in a very privileged and untypical times in the history of the church pretty much ignored by those in power and pretty much left alone what might this mean all this mean for us well one implication i think uh, is for our evangelism our attempts to reach out with the gospel to tell people that jesus is lord and to tell them of him and his kingdom and the salvation that his death won for us. Because I'm pretty sure that behind Jesus' words in Matthew 28, we get the ideas of Daniel 7. See if you think I'm right as I read those words to you as we close. Matthew 28, at the end of the Gospel, after his resurrection and ascension, uh, after his resurrection, Jesus comes to his disciples and says this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that we don't always see the Lord Jesus as he really is, the eternal ruling King. And we confess, Heavenly Father, that uh, it is easy to uh, lose sight of that fact. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we pray uh, for all those in our world who suffer now for allegiance to your son and cry out how long heavenly father may they have confidence in christ's rule and ultimate vindication and heavenly father as we go out seeking to make you known aware of our own weakness and frailty may we go confident in the knowledge that you are with us as we seek to make disciples, that you have all authority on heaven and earth and that you are with us always to the very end of the age. And we ask these things for Christ's sake. Amen.